Time for the serious things to happen. We're adjusted. Not well adjusted, but adjusted. Hello, and welcome back to another week of Murders a Drag with me, Aura Van Dank. I'm in my party girl wig uh, with my party girl outfit on. It's all sparkly. Aura, are you glad that I'm like actually back this week and it wasn't an entire year this time? Actually, a little bit longer. Because I know I am. I'm, like, back on schedule. I'm doing my thing. I'm having lots of fun with it. So, it's a party girl fantasy paradise. That's what that is. And I've been living it. The most of it. I didn't have any gigs this past week. Which was kind of nice to kick it and lay down. But it's also like, okay, <laughs> book me. Because, hmm, <laughs> hmm, hmm, hmm. This is going well. So far, so good. That's me, the queen of strong beginnings and less than strong endings or middles or the rest of the kit and caboodle. Anyway, yeah, I haven't done much this week and I glazed past that lazy shit part of my life. And I'm getting to see Florence and the Machine on Friday for the first time in about four years, I think. Yeah, three or four, four years, actually, since I saw her in Boston with my sister. She's doing these intimate concerts, and I'm going to, oops, I don't know if you heard any thumbs thumbs, but that was me. No ghosts here that I'm aware of. I shouldn't have said that. I'm alone in my garage. Not my garage, my fancy studio. But anyway, it's intimate concerts with Florence. She's doing two, one in LA, one in New York. Well, she's doing a couple in um, the, across the pond in her home realm, but that's the ones that are accessible to me. Wow, I can't talk. I'm too excited. I'm going to Florence and the Machine on Friday, and it's going to be an intimate night with Florence and the Machine, and she can finally recognize that we've been best friends since 2012. Oh my god, 10 years! <gasps> mm. This week, I wanted to get into a case that I read about a while back. I had seen an episode about it on Snapped, and I have my feelings about the show. We'll get into that in a little bit. And it just really inspired me to want to cover it from a queer perspective. This case happened in Florida when a woman was murdered by an ex-lover in 2013. Like I said, I saw the episode. I, I have I mixed have feelings. I like that their stories are getting out there on a national platform because, I mean, everybody knows of Snapped. If they don't watch it, they know of it. And it... it I just struggle with it, though, because I've got, I know a friend who, who they covered a story that was really close to her, and she wasn't very happy with the way that it was done, and, or the fact that it was done at all, honestly. I've just always kind of had mixed feelings about it. It feels really sensationalized, and we're not really focusing on the victims here. We're more just like, whoa, this crazy woman snapped. This is nuts. Look how crazy women can be. And it just gives me mixed feelings. And I will say, to their credit, to the network's credit, to the show's credit, they do much better now. This was an older episode. You know, 10 years ago, it was a different story. Things were, uh, let's face it, things were a lot different 10 years ago than they are now as far as true crime goes. We're a little bit more respectful. Well, most of us are a little bit more respectful of victims' families and victims themselves, survivors. So, I mean, the fault isn't all on Snapped. It's just my opinion, and I find it a little bit cheesy. But that's why I do my show, because this is the part of those cases that you should know. Not necessarily just the sensationalized murders, which in some cases is important to the story because the murder was sensational, for lack of a better word, or insane. And that's just the details, and that's just the truth and part of the story that needs to be told. But sometimes you're harping on these awful details just to get those, like, that gore, shock factor. The same reason I don't like the Saw movies. Anyway, if you didn't know my opinion on that, you know it now. It's just that cheesy and murder are generally not two things that I find go together. Unless it's at, like, a middle school dinner theater production where you're playing a role for a murder mystery themed dinner theater. That was specific. Let's not dig into that trauma. This week's case is the murder of Crystal Parker. Crystal was born September 27th, 1978. She was born in Atlanta, Georgia. Apparently, when she was very young, she grew up climbing trees, running around, throwing rocks, batting sticks, being very athletic. I mean, just honestly, one of those kids where you probably should get one of those cute little leashes that for some reason went out of style that I think we should bring back. Hashtag bring back children leashes 2022. But in the 70s and 80s, they didn't have that. So she was up the tree in the tops of the trees and having a great grand old time. Crystal was very competitive with her twin brother growing up. 
both of them played sports and Crystal always wanted to get the MVP trophies and throw the balls better and faster and harder and whatever it is in sports that makes you a good player and better than your twin brother. Working on a limited knowledge of the sports ball here. That competition at a young age through her teen years basically trained her into like a monster athlete and by the time she got into high school she crushed all of the sports that she signed up for she did the basketballs she did the rugby's she did the lacrosses she did the all of those really aggressive sports that she was dominating at and actually won herself a scholarship to college for basketball right as she was finishing up high school getting ready to graduate all of the fun stuff she started to have a medical crisis and it got in the way of her even attending school let alone doing the athletics that she was doing and when she went to the hospital it turned out that she got diagnosed with lupus which is a degenerative disease and needs to be handled google it i'm not a doctor and i'm not an athlete and i don't want to sit here and talk out of my ass for any longer but i do know that because of her diagnosis she had to pull out of pretty much everything and take time for herself to heal and to get treatment. And apparently what I didn't know was that with lupus, you can end up needing chemo. And Crystal went in for chemotherapy. She went in for physical therapies, the whole gamut of painful and miserable treatment. Crystal came out the other side definitely much mentally stronger, but physically she wasn't able to do sports and all of the things as well as before, but she was still able to be pretty... Whew, and she could still fight a bitch if need be. She put her smart, smart brain brain to work in 2006 and got herself a degree and a job as a police officer patrolling a beat in East Point, which is a neighborhood in Atlanta, Georgia. Having settled down and gotten that job, Crystal decided to go out and explore the local LGBT scene in Atlanta, which is Fabulous. Shout out to my Atlanta sisters. Mwah, mwah. If you're not watching the show and you don't message me after that shout out, then this is how I'm going to know that you're not watching the show. We're going to have a problem. But any hoots, as she's going out to the club, she actually scores herself a side gig as security for one of the gay bars. And whilst working security one night, she sees this fine female from across the room and being confident and very, very pretty, she decides that she's going to go on over there and get herself a wife. After a very short exchange of words, Crystal is now Danielle Alexander. After that night, one thing leads to another, leads to a U-Haul, leads to they are moved in and actively living together and not really sharing responsibilities, which ends up being a problem. And I'm not stereotyping and saying that this is exclusively a lesbian thing because I did the same exact thing with Charlie and moving to California, but I think the difference might be that I used pods, whereas a lesbian may have used a U-Haul. Crystal, off the bat, falls head over heels for Danielle because Danielle is gorgeous and starts spoiling her and being kind of her sugar mama, but her sugar mama to a point where she just wants to see her sugar baby succeed. She doesn't necessarily want just to financially support and let her do whatever. She wants, she wants to teach her to fish rather than just give her the meal ticket. Did I just make a... I really just made a Bible reference on this show. No! But Crystal does go out and work to support them 110% and to support Danielle in whatever it is that she wants to do. A few years in, Crystal and Danielle, they're super in love, super cute, mwah, mwah, mwah. They decide to get married at an Atlanta Pride Festival, which is a huge festival, and it was probably adorable, and I wish I could have found pictures of it, but I could not. But I imagine that it was super cute and quintessential lesbian pride wedding. Crystal's the one who helped and encouraged Danielle to settle down, get her GED, and get into a college program that Crystal was going to pay tuition for, just so that Danielle could, again, get herself together and support herself, along with Crystal's help. But it was more about the principle than the money itself. And almost in a show of proving how much she loved Crystal, Danielle went out and changed her name from Danielle Alexander, as she was known, to Danielle Parker, and made that official that they were married, and it was a thing, and they were going to be wifeys forever. Very much wifey energy right now. 
And at this point, Crystal was doing absolutely stellar at her job. And in 2012, aside from being named Officer of the Year, which is huge, she was promoted to corporal. And she was so proud because she worked her ass off to get it. I mean, she was even working side gigs security while getting promoted and moving through the ranks at the East Point Police Department. And both the title of Officer of the Year and the promotion made a huge difference in her career. And Crystal was really starting to become very successful. And to toot Crystal's horn more, because honestly, this is all just facts, just listing facts, not not trying to frame her as a saint or anything. This is just truth. This is just how she was. Her community loved her because she lived in East Point and policed in East Point. So she understood the struggles, the socioeconomic struggles, the everyday struggles, the petty struggles, the things that didn't really matter, the things that did matter. She understood all of that and took it into account when she was policing within her own community. Even though Crystal was well-loved in the community, that didn't really mean that the community was without its issues overall. It was still not a great area. There was lots of crime, there were lots of break-ins. It was a rough place to live. Things started getting pretty bad in the neighborhood with crime rates, and Crystal decided that she wanted to purchase guns for the home and teach Danielle how to use them just in case anything happened where they needed to defend themselves. Crystal even got worried enough to teach their elderly neighbors, who they had dinner with every Sunday and watched a movie with, very cute, how to use guns of their own in case the neighbors had to defend themselves, because things were getting tough in the area. On July 7th, 2013, that very cute old lady neighbor, who went to dinners every Sunday, went to the dinner that she was supposed to go to, and when nobody answered the door and she found it unlocked, she got super concerned because this was very unlike them to leave their door unlocked in a rough neighborhood like this. So she went inside to check on Danielle and Crystal. The neighbor was immediately greeted by an awful smell, and when she turned a corner, she saw blood and booked it back out of the house and called police. And when police got there, they walked into the house, didn't find Danielle anywhere, but found Crystal in the bedroom, in bed, dead from a gunshot wound to the head. The East Point police immediately had a fire under them to solve this because one of their own had been murdered. And I know that that it does off the bat make you a little mad because it did the same thing for me. But I also have to take into consideration that it is a little bit of human nature because they're friends with Crystal. They know her personally and they're now looking at her murdered. So they definitely have more attachment to the case than others. Still wish they would spend more time on all of these cases, but I also understand human nature. Off the bat, the officers suspected that it was a disgruntled perp that Crystal had arrested that knew where she lived or had hired a friend and told them where Crystal lived. Something along the lines of a disgruntled perp. But before they could even explore their first gut option, they had to find the woman who, by all accounts, was Crystal's wife, who was nowhere to be found. They were also very sketched out because... Crystal's wallet, phone, and the murder weapon were all missing from the apartment. But there was no sign of forced entry, no sign of a struggle, and no other signs of robbery. So, I mean, most of the signs were already pointing to Danielle. The neighbor that actually walked in to check on them and called the police gets a call while police are actively at the scene investigating from Danielle. And Danielle says, oh, one of my friends said that they saw police cars at the apartment is crystal okay and the neighbor's like no you need to get over here now which is kind of bullshit being the first thing to come out of danielle's mouth because it should have been an explanation to why she was missing for the entire time that they were looking for crystal i mean crystal had been dead for multiple days when they found her and the door was on i mean danielle should have known that something was wrong before that exact moment But when Danielle gets to the scene, she has an excuse for everything and explains that it had been about three months now that her and Crystal had been separated, that they had actually amicably broken up and were only seeing each other two nights a week, which would conveniently be why Danielle hadn't checked on Crystal in three days and thought nothing of it. Convenient, but very stupid. Danielle claims to police that she hasn't seen Crystal since the past Thursday morning when Danielle left for school after spending the night at the apartment. Already thoroughly sketched by the lack of story and shitty story that they were supplied by Danielle, police put in a petition to the phone company to get records from Danielle's phone and Crystal's phone, even though they don't know where that is. 
Looking at some of the records, when Crystal hadn't shown up for work on July 4th, 2013, she gets a text from her captain asking where she is. And on that same day, he gets a reply, the captain, from Crystal's phone saying that her dad is in the hospital and she might be out of work for a couple of days. The next day, it's the same dealio. Crystal doesn't show for work. The captain calls and gets the similar response. Dad's still in the hospital. I'll be in when I'm in. All the while, police find out from medical examiners, Crystal would have been dead by late, late evening, July 3rd, 2013, or early, early, early morning, 4th of July, 2013, meaning that none of those texts could have actually been sent from Crystal because she was already dead. Also meaning whoever had Crystal's phone most likely was the one who murdered Crystal. This was a little bit more info. It kind of suggests that it would have been a personal murder with the replying to the boss's texts and none of the things in the apartment being taken. But police still had no murder weapon and didn't have any idea of the story of what happened or why any of it happened. Police go and speak to Crystal's family to try to get a few more pieces of the puzzle, maybe some info about the relationship between Danielle and Crystal, and boy oh boy, do they get information about the relationship between Danielle and Crystal. It turns out that Danielle was broken up with. It was not a mutual agreement, and Crystal was not happy to be breaking up with Danielle, but was very adamant about breaking up with her. Danielle actually shaped up to be quite the butcher, and from all accounts of Crystal's family, Danielle stayed home all day playing video games, not paying a single bill, not working, not putting in any effort to school, and Crystal began to get tired of that kind of a situation. It wasn't fair that Crystal was out there working, paying tuition, trying to help Danielle get on her feet, and Danielle was refusing to do so. Crystal definitely got very wrapped up in making sure that Danielle was provided for and had access to all of those opportunities that Crystal felt Danielle deserved and didn't notice that some things weren't right in the relationship. Danielle was very possessive of Crystal, wanted to know where Crystal was every second of every day, who was texting her, when was she working, what's the schedule, come right home, if the time it takes you to get home from work isn't right, where were you, that kind of a abusive situation. And it turned out to all be projection because Danielle was cheating on Crystal. Now, Crystal wasn't stupid and knew Danielle was checked out from the relationship. She didn't know what was going on, per se, but she definitely felt that there was a rift, and it caused this on-again, off-again, toxic relationship between the two of them. Until, one day, Crystal comes home from work and sees a familiar car in the driveway of another woman they know, so she sneaks around back and actually catches Danielle with another woman, Kiki ki in about to So Crystal is not happy, and ends it right then and there and kicks Danielle to the curb where she should have stayed, but did not. Crystal still could not keep away from the Punani and invited Danielle over twice a week so that they could bone. And that was kind of the agreement. And that's why Danielle was going to Crystal's twice a week. But Danielle, very toxic, very possessive, is not happy to find out that Crystal is talking to another woman in Florida, where Crystal's dad lives, and is quickly getting serious with her over messages that Danielle finds. Through the phone tracking of Danielle's phone, police find Danielle at Crystal's house for 25 hours and 17 minutes from July 3rd to July 4th, that window where the medical examiners determined Crystal was murdered, and found that three days after the murder, Crystal and Danielle's phone were pinging together. Like I said earlier, that's pretty much the smoking gun, and they don't even need a gun. They get a warrant at that point and find Crystal's phone, wallet, and a bullet casing matching the one from the gun that was used to kill Crystal, which turns out to have been Crystal's own duty-issued firearm, just to make things worse. With more than enough for an arrest, they take Danielle in for questioning and show her pictures of Crystal's body after Danielle left Crystal in a room for three days after killing her, getting no reaction out of Crystal except for one thing that she repeated again and again and again, which was, I want a lawyer. 
So on July 9th, 2013, Danielle was arrested and charged with Crystal's murder. The case was very, very strong against her. Like I said, smoking gun evidence, bullet casing, literally everything pinned against her. But then they find Danielle searching on Google on her computer how to interview with police and how to pass a lie detector test. She also very cleverly searched multiple times for Crystal's obituary before Crystal was even found dead. Through more phone record snooping, it was determined that Crystal was still alive at 6.30 a.m. on July 4th because she was on the phone with her new girlfriend in Florida. That's when Crystal and Danielle's phone start pinging together. So the theory is that Danielle hears Crystal on the phone with a new girlfriend, making plans, talking shit, whatever it may be. And that starts an argument. Danielle knows where the guns are kept in the house, knows how to use them, murders Crystal, takes the wallet, the phone, and the weapon. You know the rest of the story. I've already told it. So every piece of the puzzle is put together. Danielle is almost sure in for life in prison, but then she decides to add more evidence to the case when they find that she had a secret boyfriend. The allegedly homosexual Danielle has a boyfriend. But this boyfriend, Quentin, he's probably just a pawn in Danielle's crazy game, but he's there, and it's part of the story, and it makes shit crazy. Apparently, Danielle had been telling Quentin that she really liked him, but she also wanted to take things slow because she was still married to somebody who was very abusive and referred to her ex-husband as scarily abusive to the point where she thought her life was in danger. This ex-husband, all the while, is most likely Crystal, after she's found out that Crystal is in love with somebody else. She claims that she's being stalked by her ex, that she's being abused by her ex still, even after they've been separated. And she's trying to get Quentin to go and murder Crystal for her. She even all but asks him to do it. And he completely says, no, I don't even want to be a part of this. And right after Crystal's murder, Danielle texts him saying, I did it. And then a couple minutes later, yep, I did it. And he knows what she's talking about. And he's just like, this. I don't want to be involved, not even a little bit. And he tries to get away, disappear, but he's later found for the case. He didn't get in any trouble because he didn't do anything wrong. But this poor guy did not want to be a part of any of this wild story that he had no idea he was getting into. And I honestly think that he was probably mentally ill from the way that he interviewed and the way that he acted. On November 5th, 2014, jury selection begins and... Danielle gets offered a plea deal. She initially declines it, claiming that she's completely innocent still and she has no idea what happened to Crystal, but then is finally persuaded to accept it and admits she is indeed who murdered Crystal. Danielle gets sentenced to life in prison with possibility of parole in 30 years, which pissed off the family a lot. They wanted no possibility of parole, but it is what it is. She's not going to get out in 30 years. She's probably not going to get out ever. If she did get out in 2023, she would be 60 years old. And hopefully by then, she's dead anyways. At least Crystal's family knows what happened, knows that she had love. Even in the end, she was talking to somebody in Florida that she really loved, making plans. And those just happened to be cut tragically short by an evil manipulative, possessive, crazy person. And that is the story of Crystal Parker in the words of Aura Van Dank. Yeah, that's another episode. Thank you for listening again to another week of me, to another moment of me in this big blue... I mean, it's not actually big. It's just a little piece of hair. Just a piece. And if you're a podcast listener and you can't see what I'm talking about, then maybe you should get on YouTube and watch some of my videos. How about it, hon? How about it? Or follow me on Twitter and, and um, what do you call it? Instagram <laughs> and the Facebooks at Murders a Drag, at Aura Van Dank, either or. Why not both? Okay. I think that's enough for this week. I think you've all had enough. I know I'm ready to take this hair out of my scalp because that's where it grows from. And I'll see you all next week. Mwah.